happy to be so slow to set up. Okay, hi. Uh, we will speak about the financial part of making DevOps. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Quentin Adam. I have a very unpronounceable Twitter handle, which is pretty cool because it's available on every social network, except one fucking guy who just stole me from Pokemon Go, but it's okay. Um, this is my day-to-day -day job. I manage a company called Clever Cloud, and uh, we are an IT automation company. So basically what's what's mean is people push their code to the Clever Cloud, and we manage to make it run like deploying, automatic scaling, automatic like you know monitoring system, backups, fix the security issue of the system. Like basically, we do all the things. You you do the code, we make it run, and we make it this on cloud, and a brand new on-premise product. And doing this stuff, we learn a lot of things because we have we have customers in uh, 1,700 cities in the world, so very big customers like banks. Very boring stuff with you know the people of the security saying all the time, yeah, we're not agree with that. And um, startups, we just uh, want to say, okay, can we do some serverless stuff and thing like that? So it's very interesting. And um, we're trying to learn a lot of things doing that and give back to the community doing talks or blog posts. So why are you here? Just we can figure out just thinking about what is to be a developer, what is to be a technical people in our industry. Because you like your job. There is a lot of people doing IT management, IT hops, IT developer, but you like your job. Because in the culture of our job, there is a lot of people who have a quest for knowledge, because what you learned before was pretty whole new, and Everything you do every day, when not something you learn at school, is something you learn doing your job, because we have a very changing world. And for a developer and for, for an IT guy, what is important is the exception of the change. Because we change of work like every time. And for this, we have the quest for efficiency. This is efficient. <laughs> so um, if you're thinking about that, um, lots of, you know, Pomodoro stuff, methodology, morning miracle, all this kind of stuff are coming from the IT world. We are this kind of people who are thinking about how to be more efficient at our work. We don't count off hours. We're thinking about how efficient we are, what have we have been done today, and not how many times I have worked. And this is all the IT world work. We have a new vision of the world. You know, all this guy working on, you know, co-working space, uh, remotely work, all this kind of stuff. And this is how we work. This is the culture of our job. The second thing is, we want to automate all the things. It's basically our job. Our job is taking stuff made by humans and automatically made it by machine. And we are happy with that. And if we can do this at scale, it's better. And there is an example of that. If you're taking Uber, you're taking the people answering on the phone, calling for more people on the road, and you know, we just replace it with machine. There is a lot of people losing their jobs this way, but their job was not intelligent. And what, what's driving is the economic change of that. Just Thinking about that, in France, we have lots of people saying, yeah, but we need to protect this job. I personally don't understand that. Because we are thinking of human making the job able to, do, to, to be done by a toaster. And as a human, I can't be compared to a toaster. It's, 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 it's not something we can be evaluation on that. So what is important is to understand that when we have automated the job, it's a cool thing, it's a machine doing it. And we need to push it for one that. And there is many things we can do with that. And in fact, it's a very progressing thing. I don't know if you have heard something about the law of accelerating returns. It's a guy called Ray Kurzweil. Um, the law of accelerating returns saying each time we make a technological progress, the next technological progress will be easier to do. And 
the technological progress of humanity will be exponential. And right now, we are there. We are driving to a very big, exponential way to change things. And we are in the place where the software is eating the world. You know, it's Mark Andreessen saying that. Mark Andreessen is the, the guy creating a company called Netscape Communicator. Okay, it was a fail on the business part. But, you know, this guy was so clever, he predicts the way internet goes, and he have creating um, an investment fund called Andreessen Horowitz, which has basically the, the most powerful, uh, the most return of investment funds in the valley. And when you say software is the the world is... In the 19th centuries, we automate the agriculture, you know, the, 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 the food production, because there was human muscle to produce that. Then we automate the manufacturer, the factory, because we automate the human muscle. We have the engine for doing that. But what we are doing today is automate the human brain, because we have the computer. And the computer is a very efficient tool to automate the human brain. And what we need to understand, and when we say software is eating the world, is the world is a very small place. So if we are not efficient, we will have a problem because the competition is not worldwide, and it will break a lot of companies which before was geographically in advantages for the competition, but no, the competition is there. I have summarized all the stuff on the on the on the blog post uh, explaining that if you need to share it with your boss. Okay, so this was basically our job as an IT person. Jump to the next thing. Companies created IT department. You know, it was in the 90s, on the 80s, and they create an IT department like they have a bookkeeper's department, or like they have people managing the office. They create an IT department. And they think it like they want the real world and the virtual world. I don't get this thing. When people say to me, you're speaking to the virtual world on the internet, when I'm sending an email to the guy, it's a real guy, it's not a virtual guy. You know, we. we on Twitter, we're not speaking about virtual things. We, we just connect to real people. It's, it's, it's important to say, yeah, there is no virtual world. Even Pokemon Go isn't a virtual world. It's a real world plus Pokemon. But it's not virtual. It's real Pokemon on the virtual world. You know, on the real world. So basically, why I'm speaking about that is, at the beginning it was people managing things that are around real. Basically, it's a virtual world. It's the world of the computer. And then they split the IT department on two different agendas. There's the people of the project, and there is the people of the run. Why? Because of bookkeeper's point of view. When a bookkeeper's speaking about spending money on the company, they're speaking about investments and return of investments. So, basically, if you make a project on the computer era, like, I need a new software, it's an investment. So, basically, what we will do is get some specs, write some code, and return of investments on this code. So, basically, we have decided that the return of investments and the deprecation of the code will be three years. So, you have to use the software for three years. Why? I, I mean, you know, this kind of stuff where we have bought this software, so now you have to use it. Yeah, but it's no more usable anymore. Uh, it's, we don't need it anymore. Oh, yeah, but if we, you don't use for three years, we're losing money. Why? Because of the depreciation. Yeah, but if we're losing it and losing some time, we are actually losing money. No, not from a bookkeeper's point of view. The bookkeeper's point of view, if we have to get a return of investments, of every investment, and the investments is three years. So basically, they, they're thinking the software is a real estate. This guy is ballsy. 
And that's why a lot of software we're creating on the vCycle. Because basically, vCycle was OK, specs, code, return of investments. And that's why we have this kind of very legacy software with people saying, yeah, we can't stop using it. Because right now, we have invested money on it. So if we stop investing money on it, it will say all the money we invest precedently on it was lost. So just throwing money on the, onto this, because throwing money onto this is not losing money, because it's, it, have, it will be depreciated and it will be a return of investment of this money. Yeah, I know, it's made complete nonsense, because it's drive, the life cycle and the evolution of the software is not driven by the business guy saying, okay, I need this tool, or I need this tool, or I need this tool. It's driven by the bookkeeper saying, yeah, this way, it happens like we have to get some money on the software, so it's okay. And this is madness. That was the first thing to understand about why we have very shitty life cycle management on many companies. The other thing is about the run, you know, the production guy, the ops team. First, these guys are very lost. Just imagine the boss of Starbucks saying to the actioner, you know, the partner at the, at the yearly thing, yeah, and thanks a lot for the help team to maintain in the servers this year. It's never happened. Basically, ops people got problem where there was a problem on servers, but when it's run, basically it's run, nobody cares. This is this kind of job, nobody cares about that. So basically, they are seen by the bookkeepers as the cost centers. You know, kind of tax we need to pay to make the company run. It's totally stupid because they don't link the return of investments of running servers to the company value. Just taking an example. If, if I rent 100 servers on Amazon Web Service, making crawling of the old price of the market share, make an analysis of this price and rebuild the price list and make thousands of money um, win on this, this is the way making return of investments of renting servers. But they never link to this. And every time I speak, you know, sometimes I, I sell of data intelligence stuff on companies. And every time I need to have servers to make the data intelligence stuff, it's a problem because it's go to the IT department. IT department cannot run hundreds of servers because it's too much. I don't know why it's too much, but it's too much. But if I take the invoice of the server myself and I sell the data row, plus a margin for me, sure, it's okay because I produce the numbers. And the problem is they didn't link the resources they need to produce the numbers to the effective choice of the numbers. So basically, it's a cut center. And there is no linked agenda between the people of the project and the people of the servers. So basically, if a developer or a, uh, you know, uh, um, a provider developers on the company need a server, it has to be built on the ops team, but the ops team will be, you know, the ops team account inside the company will be affected by the choice of a developer, so they don't, they, they are not agree to give this to the developer team. So it's a problem because these guys are trying to keep their budget low, and the other guy needs some tools to effectively uh, run the company. So the goals are not aligned. And that's why in many companies, developers think the ops team is just like fucking morons. And the ops team thinking the project guys are just like dreamers who want every new technology is new. And for this, we have the workforce provider, you know, like the people who are basically renting guys. They rent guys if the project is not finished. So, 
why the project will be finished on time if we can run the guy more. Yeah, but it's better to have the workforce on PlayStation and not on salary because for the bookkeepers, it's better to put this on this case and not in this case. And it's exactly just for that because they don't want to increase the salary cost of the company. But for this, it reduces the whole organization efficiency. And just for financial rules, we're killing the productivity of all the people working on the IT because they have like no technical alignments, no technical budgets together, and we have like different agenda on the same stuff, and it reduces efficiency of all these people because all these people are not the same goal. And then nobody takes care about the technical debt. Who think technical debt is something bad? Yeah. Technical debt is not bad. Technical debt is a debt. Let me explain what I, I, I mean to that. If I create a product in just two days and sold to few customers just right now, but I know this product is crap, selling to customer right now is interesting because I will win some money to change the product and make it better. I create technical debt, I remember the date because I win some money and I return some investment on that. Because technical debt is a tool. Every technical choice we do is a technical debt. But the important point is when you have a technical debt, don't make a new debt to just reimburse the first technical debt. You know, is this kind of legacy software we will need to maintain more and more and more. And if you're throwing money on, into uh, something shitty, it's exactly what you're doing. Technical debt can be something cool. The point is, you need to learn how to build the time bound. I explained that. At Clever Cloud, what we do? At the beginning, we have just few requests, few people managing application on top of Clever Cloud. So basically, we build some quick fix and hacks to manage the stuff. But no, we have hundreds of applications created every week. So fixing, you know, small hacks are just cracking times after time, but we need to fix it. When we create a software, we create it in the most efficient way, the most quickest way. Knowing that this will crack at a time, and we almost know the time every time. And what we do is, when this will be slow, and begin to be complicated, we will move it in another hardware with more gigabyte of RAM, SSD, hard drive, and things like that. Doing that, we will win a little bit of time, like five months. If we do that, it means that we need to rewrite the whole software. Like, we move the software, re start rewriting the software, and put it in production. The problem is a lot of people have problem of performances into a shitty software. They move it to SSD hard drive, more gigabit of RAM. Okay, we fix the problem. No, no, you don't fix the problem. You're just buying some time to rewrite the stuff. You know, it's the difference between creating time bombs you manage and make another debt to reimburse your technical debt. I, I am clear on that. Everybody is okay with that? And it's, it's very important to understand that because you will create something like that every time, but you need to know how you will reimburse it. Then, enter the DevOps thing. There is two ways to do the DevOps. The first is, I don't like the ops team, so basically I will do their work uh, instead of them, you know? You know, it's the old Docker thing of, we all ask for the dev, so for the ops team to put Docker, and we make the Docker images you know, because we are developer and we know how to administrate system. I never read any uh, uh, change log of the kernel Linux, but I'm pretty sure I know it works. DevOps is a way to work. Uh, um, you know, right now there is a lot of 
workforce provider who basically sold DevOps profile. What is DevOps profile? DevOps is a way to work. It's not a job. It's not developer making the job of ops or jobs making the job of developer. Why? First, it's, it's, it's not going in the historical pattern. If, you, if you're thinking about that, on the 12th century, you go in a castle and there was one guy. This guy speaks Latin, you know how to read. It was a doctor, almost, alchemist. You know, all the stars are going on the sky. And, uh, you know, it was the people who know things. You know what humanity knows. It was the people who knew. But today, it's not the same people who surgery your brain, put some, 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 um, some rocket on the sky, fix your car. It's not the same work. Because people, uh, the, the knowledge of mankind is impossible to fit on the head of one guy. So basically, people are making expertise more and more. And more people are more and more, you know, very focused on what they do, and which is really cool. So when a developer taking the job of the ops, saying, I will take the job of the ops plus mine, is basically going into the past of the history, which is not a good thing. The other thing is DevOps is a fusion of developer and run inside the new automated workforce. And when I say fusion of developer and run, I mean Budget fusion. People have to have the same budget in the company. They have to be the same boss, and they need to align the goals. If you want the IT to be efficient, they need to have the same goals on the time. So if you want to do DevOps for real in your company, the only possibility to do it is the fusion, the budget, and the management of the fork first because it will not be the project, the developer, and the ops team. It will be the people providing the tools on the company. And then we can build a continuous delivery pipeline and something efficient. For being efficient on that, we need to free them from the old constraints. First, the company stack. You know, or the company internal framework. What is this point of making, okay, the company choose to use only this technology? Why? You know, I'm building, uh, I, you know, and the people building, you know, mention or buildings. Mm, the company have decided we only use Hammer. Why? Because we are thinking the Hammer is the best tool. Yeah, but if we need to put some cables into walls, you know, uh, have some les, les vis, je sais plus comment on dit. Thank you. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it will be something, yeah, but use the hammer. It's exactly the company stack means. And about the internal framework, the other thing is, more you have to code, more you have to code to maintain. So basically, more you are throwing money into that. So. The most important thing to think is we need to remove some code. Because if we have no more code, we will have no more code to maintain, which is good. OK, from a bookkeeper point of view, remove some code is complicated because we have write this line of code. It's a giant bird. We have write this line of code, so we have bought it. If we cannot depreciate it for three years, we have a problem. Yeah, but computer science doesn't work like that. If I can remove some code, it's cool. We need to break this kind of stuff. And remove a code is a good thing, because it's, it's lesser your code base, and smaller is your code base, more agile you are. So basically, Removing our code is a good thing. The other point is about the power of rebuild everything. When we created Clever Cloud, we have something for the reverse proxy, which was a very complicated software. We've write it with Scala and Netty and everything. For almost 10 months, we've writing this stuff, and we put it in production. It was a nightmare. It was not stable. 
there was errors, the stack cross was not understandable. There was a lot of problem with this stack. And we're just like, we spent 10 months doing it. It's so complicated. Oh, we can, oh, we can figure that. And one of the guy of the team, one night saying, okay, fuck it, I rewrite the stuff. He basically spends the night rewriting the stuff and at 10 a.m. in the morning, put it in a beta test. Five days later, we put it in production because it was very stable. Why? Not because he was a genius, but basically he is a genius, but it's not the point. Not because he was a genius, but because he was knowing the job. When we're architecture and begin the first software, we make a lot of assertion, which is basically false, because we don't know the job. We don't know the story of that. We don't understand clearly what we are doing. So basically, we were fixing and fighting against our architecture for months. But rewriting the stuff from the beginning, you know all the story of the first software. You have the value of understand what it needs. And rewriting it, it never makes the same mistake. And what's important on this is, first, rewrite everything is important because you, you, you just throw up all the, 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 the very early mistake you made. But secondary is, the value is on the people. Because this guy was clearly understanding what is our job. And this is valuable. This is the most important thing. This guy was clearly knowing what he, what he was doing. And it was why it was so important. He can rewrite it. So the power of rewrite everything is quite important if you want to go on the DevOps thing. The other part is the security voodoo. First, we need to be agree on some point. First, the security point is totally evolving. This is the number of security issues reported at CVE every year. It's growing like hell. And now the security is no more a process. It's a process and no more a reaction. Old times, Debian's family. This software is old software. It's battle tested. No, guys, it's just old software. Ghost, Shellshock, Poodle, all this security was really fixed in the code base. For Ghost, which is basically root privilege escalation of you can do any code you want, so basically a very important security leak was fixed in the code since four years. But you know, the Debian family is more like it's old code, it's battle tested. No, it's just old code. You need to be up to date all the time. And then fix all the time new CVE. More. The Debian family has this, you know, particularly uh, of we have maintainers. Our maintainers, what they do? They're taking the old code base. They're taking new feature or new fix on the new code base, which is totally different because it's four years of development ahead. They're taking some code and put it in the, in, the, in the old one and trying to comply with small fixing, nothing understanding about what they do. And when it's happened to comply, they say, okay, it's fixed. And they can create, some, in this way, they can create something like, get me a random number, it's four. Oh, four is a random number, I will give it to everyone. Like breaking the random number, breaking the SSH system, breaking all the stuff, because they don't know what they're doing. Like imagine Frankenstein doctor decoping the arms of a baby and put it in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the whole people, you know. Like it's exactly that. The way maintainers of Debian are working, I don't get it. So just stopping doing that, just being on the process and not a reaction. We are not here to stop a fire. <laughs> the other part is about, you know, trusty network. If you are inside the company network, we can trust you. You are inside the metaphor of the fortress. The trusty network is no more viable. 
you need to encrypt, securing, and have access control on every server, every API, every service in your company. There is no more network we can trust. It's false. You know, I was in a big company a few years, a few days ago, and it was throwing me, a, uh, drawing me a, a chema of the architecture saying, there, there is a big firewall. So everything there is safe. Yeah, it's not the reality. It's, it's, what you're drawing there is just a schema. It's, it's not the technically real result. A, a firewall is just basically IP table, so we don't get it. You have, you have, you have I, I, I assume there is a guy called Jim, which is basically in, uh, in the exec team, and um, he loves to open all the funny PowerPoint we sent to him. You know, the funny PowerPoint drawing a tunnel to the internet and giving you access to the... You think a, pa a firewall cannot break this guy? No, guys. <laughs> the firewall is just like, you know, an expensive box you bought that uh, it don't use to anything. So basically, you need to end this metaphor of something you are inside the fortress. There is no more trusted network anymore. Then, the performance bullshit. You know, this guy making all the optimization. We will make tertiary operator everywhere because it's more efficient. First, it falls. The compiler will optimize your code anyway. And second, the most important thing is code have been redoubled. Simplicity have been done, and you need to be able to push new software every time. Efficiency is to be, it's to read is often. So don't over-engineer stuff. You know, this guy coming to me saying, we need a Cassandra big data system. Okay, cool. How many terabytes of data we have? Well, 100 megabytes of data. Why do you need a Cassandra system? Just put it everything in the memory and, uh, you know, we don't need a, 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 a lots of, Big data system if you don't have big data. And big data is over the terabyte. So if you don't have a terabyte, so stop speaking about big data. And the architecture will be the important point there. Architecture is something we can save you. So as an ops team, you need to get some time on the architecture system. Because when you will have a problem of performance, you will not have a linear problem. Performances are, you know, performances are the exponential thing because you have a task to be done on one window time, you know, and if your task is coming to expand more time, then the other task will start with this kind of stuff and you will break the entire system in just a few times. So basically, a real performance problem is the architecture problem and not in your card. It's architecture problem. You need to think about that. To, to, to just not stopping a system. And this, you know, these words. Yeah, we have a big company. We have nobody health problem. I heard that I like thousands of times. I heard sometimes there is a company saying to me, yeah, but you know, our developer team is really different than others. Git is not fit for us. Our real need is CVS. You don't know Git, and your guys don't want to change, but your needs are perfectly the same that all over the, 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 the developer around the world, which is basically writing codes together. So basically, you have the other's problem. So just try to have the same solution than them, because it works. Just let's speak about the IT department future like quickly because I know I'm not uh, totally on time. As IT department, you need to be friend of the other th part of the company. When I say that is you need to get away the maintenance period. Guys, this year we have the technology on high availability, big data system, and everything like that. You cannot break the, the, the business tools because you have a maintenance. Thinking about that, so people giving you electricity, calling you, saying, ah, yeah, we will 
be taking down the electricity for three hours, we have a maintenance system to do. What do you say to him? It's not my problem, guys. I just pay for electricity. I want electricity. That's the point. So get your shit together. I don't give a fuck. Just give me electricity. And it will be normal for you to do that. It's exactly the same thing for the people in the business. Maintenance period on the mail server. What the fuck? How we can work without mails? You know, so just be clear on that. No more maintenance period. You need to architecture your system for no more in maintenance. The other point is to be focus and efficiency. Focus and efficiency mean the first thing. You need to let go to make the IT of all the company. Company are using external provider. First, the marketing don't like the IT department because the marketing need a reaction for the next week. And the IT department say every time, yeah, it will can be ready maybe in three, four months. External company will be ready for the next week. So let it go with that. It's okay. All those people making software for you. But what, when I think focus and efficiency is, first, what is the layers of your infrastructure? What is your added value? If you can externalize all the parts, it's okay. Automate all the non-value part, because automate things will we win you sometimes. And if you can bring it on the top of a public cloud or managing system, it's a cool thing. Like, there is a lot of company wanted to have something like, we will send our newsletters from our servers. Guys, it's a really bad idea. Maintain the reputation of mail server is so complicated, stuff like that. You want to send, I don't know, 10,000 mails, it will cost you $10 on Megan, so it's okay. Just use Megan, Mayjet, or anything else to send your newsletter. Stop sending this with your exchange. You will just kill the reputation of your servers, and your customers will not get your, 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 your mails after. It will go to the spam. So just managing the stuff on this kind of stuff. You need to push on commodity. When I say push on commodity, it has to be easy for people in the company to ask something on the IT guys and try to use the human grain for valuable usage. I basically don't know all these GIFs have been created. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand what, what happened to this picture. You need to release early and release often. When I say this, is, there is a lot of company who still have, you know, period for putting new software in production. No, it's Christmas. We cannot make new production for one month. One month, guys. The competition on the market will be, will be far ahead of you. You need to be able to release a lot of things in all the time. And you need to build toolkits. You cannot break the way people are managing to use external company on the business side to make them thing work. But what you can do is be sure the data of the company is ready and you have the maintenance of the company information. So first, you build toolkits like API. All the company can be driven by API and the business guy can request some API tokens to speak with a lot of software. So you need to have api.mycompany.com access to say, okay, if you want to access the data of the company, it will be happening through the API, and I will log everything going there and link it to an ACL system and a basic SSO, I don't know what, but you need to know who have access to the data. In the other side, what's happening? They will break you using you know, export on CSV, and they put the CSV on the, on the new database of the other providers, and you know, the data of the company will be dispersed. So you need to be focused on that, happy eye and SQL. And maybe make something visual. One of the company we work for when, we, when I have um, a consulting company, we build happy eye, we build an SQL system, and on top of that, we build a CSS framework on top of Bootstrap, which is the color of the company, how to make the company, and say like that. And we call it design.mycompany.com. So basically, 
any provider in the world, it was a worldwide company, any provider in the world can just add it on the dependency and make the same look and feel, stuff like that for the company. It was really impressive because it was, you know, something everybody can use for simple and cheapest the cost of external software for all the old company very efficiently and make, you know, look and feeling right on this kind of stuff. The other point is everything has to be self-service. If someone needs to access the data, you need to click on a button, get a token, going to start to work. We, we do this kind of stuff with worldwide companies like they have all their products in only you know, sheets on Excel. We put it in the API. And we have Chilean marketing, people in the Ukraine, everybody was using this API. And it was really great because for the first time of the company, we don't put in to the customers false information. The information was controlled by the people of the IT world. But external provider can do anything. And it was cool because the people in Chile won't call the IT department in France to do the job on something marketing. They will ask for a web agency local. And it's normal. You have to accept that. So the self-service part is really important. Just thinking, I, the IT department of company, we are creating tools for other for make them efficient. So just focusing on that. And thank you for listening to me. So we're catching up on our time that we gained this morning. Um, <laughs> we have time for like one question, and then we have three ignites. One question. I have a lot of awesome Clever Cloud stickers. I put it there if you want. Okay. Um, we have a sponsor.